Okay, so let me say a couple of words about where we are in the reading list. We're going to start today. We're done with the segment on contracts and mechanism design theory and applications. And we start today, Volrossian general equilibrium, which you've seen a bit before already, but we'll review and give the proper definitions for the first 20% of the lecture. And then the rest of the lecture is devoted to uh, an important application of general equilibrium theory. And in particular, it has to do with trade. So this lecture today is the theory with some really startling and interesting propositions. And then with trade on our minds, we'll go back to the Thai data and take a look at trade flows and financial flows that have changed over time as the country became more liberalized or more open internally. And then we're gonna go to a parallel lecture on the US that's gonna look at trade flows and potentially financial flows across states in the US where we'll be analyzing the impact of tariffs so and or china shocks china imports so these dare i say it it may or may not be on your mind if it's on your mind already you know the motivation here is a US policy decision which is very much in the news and in some respects a big part of the upcoming election so I don't know if the timing of these lectures are good or bad, but uh, anyway, we'll be all we'll be talking about U.S. trade policy within two lectures. Okay, so that's what's coming up. And today's lecture is got two starred readings: the Kreps book on Section Six Point One and this Moskal L. Winston in Green. I rarely assign this book, but on the other hand, the lecture is based very closely on that chapter, so I went ahead and just listed it in WG chapter 15D, although it's quite a famous model. Well, we've been using MWG in the theorems and so on, but I've never really featured it so so heavily. In terms of the overall, you know, just to see it in one spot, again, we're gonna do Orazian equilibrium and then two applications of trade in Thailand and the US. That's actually gonna complete Lecture 15 completes the current segment of lectures before the second exam. So problem set four, which was released last, last thing I wanna do before getting to the lecture is to uh, review a bit what we did last time. I deliberately didn't pick out very many questions here. Allow risk aversion on the part of the borrower. There are several advantages to writing down programs in lotteries list two of them and explain. So let's see if I can get some. Charles, you want to take a crack at that? Uh, I think I can guess one, uh, definitely at least one of them, which if I remember correctly, is that it allows you to, it allows you to like make an incentive, you may so select between um high, like people with high income and low income, if you don't know the income already. So like someone, some if you're, risk averse in any correct manner, then if you have a, a lottery, then someone with low income might might prefer a lottery a lottery with uh, some something like you might prefer the different the different risk risk uh risk 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 return trade offs that at different incomes or let's just it was just to select between various things and hope with some of the constraints. Uh, the other one don't remember the exact details. I haven't quite gotten yet. Oh, uh, the first one is good. Um, I, I'm going to guess something like helping, making people more willing to, like maybe making people willing to, not as willing to borrow or something like that, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, let's see. If Carrie, you want to take a, can you get one more of them? Um, is it like the incentive constraints could be non-convex, um, so it might be hard to solve? Yeah, good. So there's various sources of non-convexities. Those incentive constraints when written without the lotteries, uh, like first order conditions of the borrow of the borrower's choice of effort, those things can lead to non-convexities. So by doing it in lotteries, we get that. 
problem solved. And also if there's some indivisibilities that would be solved. There are two indivisibilities in this problem. One has to do with occupation choice. You're either a wage earner or an entrepreneur. That's a binary choice. Um, so the lotteries kind of smooth that over because you can effectively choose the probability. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, there could be sort of indivisibilities in the discreteness of the capital grid. Like you're gonna capitalize a high amount or a low amount. And, uh, and again, lotteries help with that indivisibility. Okay. So the next one is really a summary uh, of what we did, but let me read it out. Um, sketch out how one can take the model with the lotteries to the data on occupation choice and estimate parameters. So does, can anyone attempt a summary of what we did last time on that dimension? Uh, Pablo? Uh, sure, I can take a stab at this. So um, I think the way that we did it was we um, kind of like given these like different parameters that like we had of like ability, education and wealth we um, kind of solve for this optimal contract, like theoretically. And then we made a likelihood function to uh, given like these solutions to kind of see like which one of these is like going to be like the best essentially. Do you remember what, how we did quote the best? The best in terms of what? Um, just kind of like the, the likelihood function uh, trying to maximize that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the likelihood function tells us uh, the probability what we, uh, uh, the, of what we are seeing in the data if the model were true. So we're choosing parameters to make that probability as high as possible. Um, okay, that's good. Any other questions about that lecture? The, the, all the other questions at the beginning here were basically you know, write it down the way we did it in class, et cetera, et cetera. So I, you know, it's not exactly conducive to asking you these questions in class, but it is important to be reviewing these reviews questions. All right. So then we come to the lecture today. This is Valrhasian equilibria with a, an application to trade. And we're going to consider trade and for the most part in a small open economy, although we'll say a little bit about putting the world pieces together at the very end. So here's the notation, which is largely a review because you have seen almost all of it before. When we write down an economy, we mean the commodity space, in this case, capital L, a finite number of commodities. I is the number of consumers, J is the number of firms, finite for each household or consumer I has a consumption set and preferences over bundles in the consumption set as for example, represented by a utility function. Each firm J has a technology production possibility set in the same L dimensional space and the economy has uh, exogenously given endowments according to this L dimensional endowment vector with the bars being the aggregates. So that's the economy. Now we say a private ownership economy, we have to specify in addition who owns what. So we imagine that consumer I has an endowment vector, L dimensional subscript I for consumer I, and it is the sum of these endowments over all the household that adds up to the omega bar L dimensional yeah. endowment vector of the previous slide. Aggregates naturally come from the individual's ownership. Each consumer, in addition to having endowments, has some share of the profits of firms. So theta ij being the share that household i has of j's profits. So these are meant to be a division of the profits. So the sum of the shares over households i for a given firm j add up to one. Everything gets distributed and household I is getting theta IJ of pi J. 
for firm J. Now, pi J is obviously an endogenous object. It could be zero. If there were constant returns to scale, it could be positive. If there are diminishing returns to scale, and also when we did the risk and return in village economies, we kind of naturally had a, an interesting and relevant special case that household I gets all the profits from the activities that it undertakes. In that case, there was a household I and a firm I, it was the same entity, and household I was getting theta IJ equal to one of, the, of its own profits as a special case. But general equilibrium theory usually, usually allows something more general. And you could think of this as a, literally as a market economy where the shares are equity shares being traded and all of the dividends are claimed by the ownership of shares. Okay, so a private ownership economy has a summary of the consumption set preferences endowments of consumer I, the production sets of all the house firms J and the shares theta IJ. Now we get to the big definition here. In this L-dimensional commodity space, a price vector P is the price of all the commodities, inputs and outputs and everything. A Volrazian equilibrium or competitive equilibrium for short for this private ownership economy is a specification of allocations with stars on them, X and Y star for consumers and firms and a price vector star here because it, it's a special price that has allocations and prices have the special properties. Each firm J is, has Y star J as the maximum of the firm's problem, which is to maximize profits. Hence, at Y star, the valuation of outputs less inputs is weakly greater than it would be for any other choice of production vector. Each consumer I is maximizing relative to the preference ordering on bundles in the consumption set but also subject to the budget constraint that expenditures at price P star for any XI that could potentially be chosen cannot exceed the right-hand side, which is the private ownership part. So omega I being the endowments of consumer I evaluated at price P star, that dot is inner product. And again, household I's claim on the profits of firm J. And the final property is that the allocation has to be feasible. And you can just read this as demand cannot exceed supply, where supply includes both the aggregated endowment and production. So you've, we worked a lot with feasibility before. We did that when we defined Pareto optimality. The difference here in general equilibrium or Volrazian equilibrium is we've added this price vector explicitly and rewritten consumer maximization problem on which we've had several lectures and firms, sorry, I reversed the order, firms max and consumers max problems. So everything's on in one spot. Okay. So a classic example is the Edgeworth box. We previously defined Pareto optimal allocations in this box as characterized by tangencies of indifference curves. Here we add one more ingredient that if they start with this endowment and we draw a price line through the endowment, then each consumer is maximizing utility subject to its budget. So consumer one here has the normal looking budget line and coming from the endowment and the tangency at X star would be the maximum. You may remember consumer two up here on the northeast is moving to the southwest in terms of increased utility and is also maximizing utility, which is achieved by a tangency on that consumer's budget line. So this line here is doing double duty. It's a budget line for each household, but the perspective is at or below consumer one, at or above the line for consumer two. And here you're seeing the star allocations, which are a competitive equilibrium Everything in the box adds up to the aggregates by construction. There is no production. They're all maximizing utility. And the price vector is characterized by the slope of this budget line. Now we could go on with a lot more interesting and some non-standard pictures of the Edgeworth box, but we're gonna save a lot of that for another lecture. Here I defined Volrazian equilibrium. I wanted to find something similar, but not identical. 
It's a price equilibrium with transfers. So here the idea is that the right-hand side is a wealth assignment. Household I has wealth W sub I. So the rest is similar. We're gonna have an allocation with stars, a price factor P, which should have had stars on it because it's a special one with the property and, and an assignment of these wealth levels such that firms maximize profits. That's the same as before. Households maximize utility, but the, the right-hand side of the budget is this wealth object. And again, when we did partial equilibrium consumer problem, we talked about prices and wealth. We had income expansion paths as wealth varied. So this formulation of the problem is consistent with that. Although in partial equilibrium, we didn't ask where that wealth was coming from. An allocation is feasible. Again, demand cannot be greater than the two sources of supply. Now the wealth assignments have to be feasible. And here's where we can say something about where wealth is coming from, namely the sum of the wealth, whatever they are, have to equal the valuation of the aggregated endowment vector plus the profits of all the firms. So somehow this stuff on the right-hand side gets distributed across the households, each household I getting wealth WI. And when we add it up, therefore, it, it sums up to the, to the right-hand side. Now note that uh, at the bottom here, a particular wealth assignment that works is what we had on the previous slide, namely give household I the valuation of its uh, endowment plus its share of the profits of the firms that it owns. So in that sense, a price equilibrium with transfers is more general, but includes the Walrasian equilibrium. That said, the word transfers may catch your eye and the idea here is that a Walrasian equilibrium with ownership specifies one level of wealth, but we could in principle redistribute that wealth by the government with lump sum taxes and transfers, and then look for a new price equilibrium. And we will, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, we will get to why we're doing this, namely any Walrasian equilibrium is Pareto optimal but it's also true that any Pareto optimal allocation can be supported as a price equilibrium with transfers as in this definition. However, to achieve the fact that any optimum can be supported, it's kind of intuitive, we may have to redistribute wealth. And again, I have a series of lectures on this, but if we're back in the Edgeworth box, this competitive equilibrium has picked out one particular Pareto optimal allocation, but as you know, there are many optimal allocations, and to get to those, we're going to have to move this budget line up or down, hence uh, redistributing the wealth. Okay, so now that we've got the concept of the Walrasian equilibrium in hand, I want to focus on the primary application today, which is production in a small open economy. You have to shift gears just a little bit. It's definitely gonna be general equilibrium. We're gonna have J firms and firms are producing goods. So they're J goods because we have J firms. Firm J produces good QJ and there are L factors of production labeled in this case Z. So Z1J is the input of the first factor by firm J and so on. And each firm J has a strictly concave production function indicated here by F sub J output of consumer good QJ as a function of the input vector ZJ. So now we specify endowments. The endowments are gonna be a given of the factor inputs. They're owned by households. And for the sake of argument, let's say they, they're supplied inelastically and they're not gonna be consumed. What we're gonna to try to do is find the factor prices that's consistent with an equilibrium within this small open economy. However, we're gonna take the prices of the goods as fixed. So in that sense, it's still partial equilibrium. Think of it as a village, as a small open economy or a country that is small relative to the rest of the world. So that these, these price factors are fixed. They're not gonna be the focus of our attention. We are going to, however, try to find the allocation of the inputs across all the firms, how those endowments of factors get used, as well as the Walrasian equilibrium price vector. So 
sperm J producing good QJ will maximize the difference between revenues and costs. So if W star say is a candidate equilibrium price vector, the firm would choose its input vector ZJ to maximize revenue minus costs at that guessed equilibrium price vector W star. P is again a given, PJ, the, the price of quantity J uh, is, is, is externally specified. So Z star J is the solution to firm J's maximization problem. And if we're finding an equilibrium, each firm will be maximizing profits and the sum of the input demands, in this case, the demand for the ELF input from firm J summing over all the firms J and in particular the stars, which are already profit maximizing, add up to the economy's endowment of the factor Z bar for the ELF factor. And this is true for all each and every factor L. This one is true for each and every firm J. So this is what we're looking for, the Volrazian equilibrium in the factor markets, picking external prices as given. All right. You already know something about the solutions to the profit maximization problem, namely the value of the marginal product should be equal to, of the ELF factor should be equal to its cost. Just differentiate this thing on the previous slide with respect to ZJ, you'll get a derivative in the F function and we'll get the factor input price on the uh, on the cost side. That's what this says, factor input price. Here's the derivative of F with respect to the L factor and that P is of course part of the exogenously given price vector. How many equations are there like this? Well, we have specify here, it's the L factor and we have uh, L capital L factors all together. And this is for the J firm, but we have capital J firms. So we have L times J equations here. And we have another set of equations, which are the equilibrium that the demand for the factors adds up to the total. But again, this is true for each and every L factor. So they're L of these guys. So we have L times J equations here and we have L equations here. So the number of equations is equal to the number of own variables. So in principle, we should be able to solve the system of equations to determine the equilibrium factor prices. It's tedious and boring to keep counting the number of variables, but it is actually useful to see, you know, if we have fully specified and potentially have a solution. So, now we've already solved in lecture four, which was about production, a cost minimization problem. So we define there the cost for firm J of producing the quantity QJ when the input vector was W. I must say, you know, I even I went back this morning in reviewing this lecture to take a look at the earlier lecture. Today, there's kind of an uneasy tension because I'm partially telling you things that you've had before on the other hand, aware that you may not remember exactly what we had before. If you go back and look, it'll all come back to you. And some of these slides are actually repeats of what was in lecture four. Anyway, when we derive the least cost way of producing an output QJ, we got that marginal cost was equal to price. Price equals marginal cost is from, you know, your very first economics micro course probably. Now this second equation is the equation that the demands for the factors adds up to the total, but it's written in an interesting and a bit unconventional way. The aggregate amount of factor L that's available is Z bar L, and we want the demands of these firms for producing, but instead we use the shepherd's lemma, the derivative of the cost of firm J with respect to the price of the L factor we derived as the amount of the L factor to be used. And again, you may or may not remember that that's the shepherd's lemma. No, here it is written down here at the bottom. Okay, so we just substitute what was written as ZLJ summation over J equal to Z bar 
we substitute in the result from Shepard's lemma to get this equation. Okay, special case, two by two, and there'll be another one, another two coming later. But for now, two, two types of firms, J equals one, two, two inputs. Now it's useful to think of the inputs as labor and capital, and that in fact will anticipate the trade applications. Are we producing goods with machines? Are we producing goods with labor? What happens to, to labor when we have a decline in manufacturing that comes from having more inputs? So these are the kind of ingredients, labor and capital being kind of obvious labels for us in the case of this two-factor model. Production functions, just to write out the notation, production function for good one has its inputs. The second subscript denotes the firm, the first one, the input. So this is the first input in firm one. The second input in firm one, F2, is output of firm two as a function of the first input in for firm two and the second input for firm two. And we're gonna assume in this special two by two model that these production functions, each of them are constant returns to scale. So it's homogeneity of degree one. So if we're given a vector of input prices for capital and labor, uh, we can define the cost of producing one unit of good J. This is called the unit cost. And you know, or you may wanna review that the cost of producing arbitrary levels just scales up or down depending on whether that other target lev level is higher or lower than one. So once we have the unit, co the cost of producing one unit, we can get the cost of producing any number of units. And what inputs solve that minimum cost problem? They're denoted with A's. So for firm J, A1J and A2J are the way to achieve the least cost when the input vector is W. Input price vector is W. Okay, so here I belabor a little bit what you've seen before, it's constant returns to scale. So the cost function is linear. Well, constant returns to scale is this linear production possibilities frontier. Cost function is linear, marginal cost equals average cost. If price of a good, say good J, is less than marginal and average cost, nothing gets produced. And when price is equal to marginal and average cost, then they're happy to produce anything, although profits are zero and price cannot be higher because they would go bananas. And that then the assertion, which I've already said twice, profits must be zero. And this is again a review slide from before. So price equals cost. This is the unit cost. Price is the price of a unit. So we have cost equal to prices. Okay. So another review, we did this before too. What's special about constant returns to scale is we can solve the problem for the uh, one unit of output minimize the cost of achieving one unit of output. And that's gonna give us, I guess I just said this, the cost for any other level of output just by scaling up and down the solution. And the ratios of input use will not be changing. I think I, in the previous lecture, I actually said I wasn't terribly pleased with how cryptically worried it was. And I gave you as an informal homework assignment to do a proof by contradiction to prove that the input use ratio is going to be entirely dictated by the input prices, regardless of the scale. That is to say, this input ratio will remain constant. And again, I quasi apologize because I'm throwing at you things from a previous lecture, it was lecture four, so that was some time ago, but I don't wanna belabor it today or we won't get to something new. So for now, we'll just accept this as a fact. Then we come to a key definition about factor intensity. Say good one is more intensive in factor one than good two, than the production of good two, if naturally firm producing good one uses relatively more of input one, relative input one relative to input two, than does firm two. So the definition to say good one is relatively more intensive than factor one means that the ratio of factor one to factor two in firm one is higher than it is in firm two. So it's a pretty natural definition.
Of course, it can move around, but the inequality remains the same. It's intense no matter what the input price ratio is, the optimizing choice of inputs will always satisfy this inequality when comparing firm one to firm two. Okay, so now something a bit new that was not in lecture four, although it's not hard. We're gonna plot the cost of producing one unit of a good. We're gonna plot that cost curve as a function of the input prices, W1 and W2. So in particular, if say, we're given W1 and W2 bar, the assertion is we're on this cost curve, then if we increase the price of the first input to W prime one, and we're supposed to be on an ISO cost, meaning same cost curve, the increase in the first factor price would mean the cost would be higher. So we have to lower the price of the second factor in order to compensate so that in on net, after we make this move, total costs are the same because it is the ISO cost curve. So this down sloping nature of the ISO cost curve plotted against various input prices makes a lot of sense. The other thing is this sort of concave shape. This comes from a property of the minimized cost. In particular, this set of input prices at or above the cost line is a convex set. And we did this a lot with respect to the consumer optimization problem. We defined quasi-concave utility functions and the associated concave indifference curves. And we had the weak upper contour set as being quickly convex. So these are analogs here. Now, the assertion is that this cost function is in fact concave. And again, as a review, but who remembers, we already had derived in lecture four that the cost function is concave in the input prices. So I just pasted in the slide to remind us. So now we have down sloping, concave. And the other thing that's going on here is at these particular input prices, what is, we go back to Shepard's lemma, the derivative of the minimized cost with respect to say the price of the first factor is the level input of the first factor and similarly for the level input of the second factor. So the ratio of uh, the slope of this line, which is the ratio of the derivatives of the cost curve at an optimum must by Shepard's lemma be equal to the ratio of the optimizing inputs. And again, logically, if you increased the input price of factor one, you would move, keeping cost constant, you would move along this ISO cost line and you would increase the amount of good two and factor two and increase and decrease the amount of factor one. You substitute away from the factor which is now increased in price. So in the earlier slide, lecture four, I didn't replicate it. We had a Walt Disney example about, you know, machinery versus humans. Now I'll just warn you, it, it is very hard to remember what's divided by what. But anyway, the fact that this perpendicular becomes steeper is consistent with the input of factor one going down because it's the inverse ratio. Okay, all right, did that. So now how do we solve for equilibrium factor prices? This is just a picture of a particular firm and what it would do, firm J, what it would do as we vary the input prices. And we wanna find particular input prices such that both firms are minimizing costs and all the factors get utilized. So remember, because we have constant returns to scale and because we've taken the right-hand side prices as arbitrary and given, you know, coming from nowhere, say, but, but certainly known to the firms, as part of the solution, the unit cost has to equal to the price for both firms one and two. So we have from this two equations and two unknowns, namely the factor prices, W1 and W2 that we wanna solve for. So visually we can actually put both firm one and firm two's ISO cost lines on the same diagram. This, in other words, I've gone from here, which was firm J to, and firm J's particular ISO cost line, talking about how it varies with W1 and W2 to this diagram in which we have not only firm one, excuse me, but also firm two. And if we're going to find an equilibrium, we're going to find a fact, a price for factor one and a price for factor two each. 
So each firm in an equilibrium is going to face the same factor prices. And each firm must lie on its own unit cost curve equal to the price from this equation. So you can see the unit cost for firm one equal to P1, the unit cost of firm two equal to P2. These are particular ISO cost curves for firm one and firm two that are associated with two of the equilibrium equations. And if we're going to find common factor prices faced by both of the firms, we only want one factor price for the first factor and one factor price for the second one. So where can that happen in this diagram? Only one spot, and that's where these ISO cost curves cross. So this is kind of displaying the equilibrium. Let me say one more word about why they're shaped in this way. You remember firm one is intensive in factor one. So if we did move along its curve, lowering W2 and increasing W1, because it's intensive in factor one, it tends to use a lot of factor one. So increasing the price of factor one is kind of a big burden for firm one. And to compensate, we have to lower the price of the second factor quite a lot relative to the compensation we would have to offer firm two. For the same increase in W1, the corresponding decrease in W2 is less for firm two than firm one because, again, firm one is intensive in factor one. So this sort of factor intensity, which I said was a very natural definition, is true everywhere by definition. Hence, the curve for firm one has to be steeper everywhere than the curve for firm two, and that's why they have to cross. Questions? Okay. So again, just to review this slide, we're looking for an equilibrium. The claim is we found it now because we have found factor prices for the first and second factor such that each firm is minimizing its unit costs associated with the cost, the unit cost being equal to price. So these must be the equilibrium quantities of the factors being utilized in each of the two firms. All right, so we're kind of doing an algorithm here. The algorithm was define Borrazian equilibrium and then and do that for this two by two model. And without telling you that I was going to do this, we're doing it sort of iteratively. The very first thing we do is solve for the factor prices. And now we're going to get the quantities this way. So the quantities naturally are going to come from a diagram where we have isoquants. So here we have the input of factor one, the input of factor two. For firm J, this is an isoquant equal production as you move along that isoquant curve. And again, you may remember or not that the optimizing with the minimize the cost of producing one unit, we find the tangency where the isoquant is tangent to the iso cost line. Now, again, it's a bit dizzying because what's an iso cost line in one space is a different looking cost line in another. In this space, the iso cost curves are concave, as I was saying. But that that's in the space of factor inputs, W1 and the prices, W1 and W2. Here, the ISO cost line is linear in the space of input quantities, Z1 and Z2. So again, the minimized cost of producing one unit of output here at these factor prices, W, is this tangency and it's associated with the inputs A1 and A2 to firm J. And again, the reason is something we reviewed before that when you take the derivative of the isoquant, we're getting, you know, DZ2, DZ1, isoquant, the quantity is staying the same. So we solve for, you know, the solution and we're getting a relationship between the derivative of the iso cost and the inputs. Okay. So now we want to solve not only for quantities, but the equilibrium uh, amounts. Now, re remember again, here we were playing around with unit costs, but we don't know the level of the quantities yet. And likewise, hence, we don't know the levels of the inputs, although we do know something about the ratios of the inputs one, once we find the equilibrium factor prices. 
So having found the equilibrium factor prices, we now turn to determining the, the inputs, but it almost looks like a review. The input ratio for firm one must be those A coefficients, the solution to the cost minimization problem in the quantity space at the equilibrium factor prices W star. This is true for firm one. It's also true for firm two. So the ratios of input being used must be consistent with the optimized ratio of inputs being used at the equilibrium factor prices. There are two equations there. There's another equation, namely that the input being used by the firm, in this case, input one and the second input two, input one in firm one, input one in firm two must sum up to the aggregate endowments. So finally, the other, another ingredient of the economy, the level of the input endowments is here on the right-hand side. And when we found an equilibrium in input use, it has to satisfy this system of equations. Now, I can show you a picture of it. You may remember that when we did production, we talked about the production box, not the Edgeworth box of the consumer theory, but the production box of production theory. We had, again, like the isoquants, input one and equal input two on the X and Y axis, firm one is oriented around zero one, and we have isoquants for firm one. And this ratio, the slope of this line is the optimizing ratio of inputs. And again, that optimizing ratio of inputs is entirely pinned down by the equilibrium factor prices, which we already found. So they have to lie on this line somewhere. Why here? Because when we go up to firm two, the same thing is true, that the optimizing input ratio of factor two to factor one must lie on this line coming out of the zero to origin. So input ratio for firm one is fixed, input ratio for firm two is fixed. Fixed at what? Fixed at these levels, as in the earlier diagrams. Hence, in an equilibrium, to be consistent with each of them, it must be where these lines cross. So this finally determines output because we have isoquants here. So, you know, firm one is producing on this isoquant, firm two is producing on this isoquant. So now we've got both the equilibrium level of the inputs, which is boom, boom, and boom, boom, as well as the outputs associated with these isoquants. Okay, are there questions so far? Well, let me just say, when you review the lecture, there's a lot of content in this lecture. Some of it's review, as I've already been apologizing, go back to lecture four, but also it's kind of stacked in the sense that each segment, you know, builds on the subsequent segments. And it's very hard to take it in when I go through these slides for the first time. But I think if you review it the second round, you'll see how the ingredients are coming together. Anyway, where are we at this point? We had two firm, we had a country, say, an economy with two types of firms, J equal one, two. We have two factors, say labor and capital. We had this economy facing externally given arbitrary prices, P1 and P2 for the firms one and two. And we have now solved for the market clearing factor prices in the input markets for the level of the inputs being used and the equilibrium quantities being produced. That's how far we got already. Okay, so now I wanna to get to the trade part and I'm gonna add the other two. So this is two firms, two factors and two countries. And the two countries are denoted A and B. So each country has the same technologies. Each country can produce good one and produce good two with these factors the two factors, labor and capital. We could have imagined different technologies in the different countries and in a minute, different preferences. You haven't seen the consumer side of it yet, but the famous two by two by two model with some amazingly cool theorems assumes identical technologies and ident identical preferences in the two countries. What's different across the two countries are the factor endowments. Namely, one country is capital abundant, the other is labor abundant. So you might, for example, have thought, although this is no longer as true as it once was, for reasons of the theorem we're about to see, that countries like 
Mexico or China are relatively well endowed with labor. The U.S. being quite industrialized is relatively well endowed with capital. And so the U.S., as, as distinct from Mexico, is capital intensive, capital abundant country, and Mexico is a labor abundant country. I choose the example carefully because, again, with NAFTA, there's all kinds of controversies about what happened to the wages of U.S. domestic workers when the U.S. increased its trade with Mexico. We now have a theorem that's going to tell us something about that. Oh, anyway, here, two countries, A and B, with different factor endowments, one being capital abundant and the other labor endowment. Now, suppose there's no trade at all. We're in autarky. What's going to determine the price of the consumption goods? Well, that's where we need the consumer part. We're going to need the representative consumer in a given country maximizing utility, given its ownership of factors as and potentially shares, although in this constant returns to scale world, there are no profits anyway. So we have an entirely domestic market like China completely closed to the rest of the world. Now we jump all the way to free trade. And if there's no cost of shipping goods around as an abstraction, the price of the two goods now have to be the same in each country. They are because if there's no cost of shipping goods around, if the price of a good were lower in one country than another, then they would get a lot of, they would basically be exporting a lot of that good at a low price to the other country that's willing to buy it at a high price. So those prices can't be different when there's no cost of shipping goods around. Now, exactly where the prices are, uh, I will show you in a minute. But first, let me give you the theorem called hector olin theorem. Suppose initially we're in autarky and neither country is trading then the price of the capital intensive good in the capital abundant country will be relatively low relative to the price of that capital intensive good in the other country. This is intuitive in terms of the economics. You have a country that has a lot of capital and relatively little labor. That's abundant capital that should drive down the price of the capital input relative to the wage of the labor input relative also to the other country, which is abundant in labor and should have, because there's a lot of labor around, a relatively low wage. So those are the two statements. The price of the capital intensive good in the capital abundant country will be lower uh, relative to the price of that capital intensive good in the other country and vice versa for labor. The price of the labor intensive good in the labor and abundant country will be lower relative to the price of that labor intensive good in the other country. Or in sum, when an input is abundant and it has a low price. Now we go to trade. We don't allow the inputs to migrate, but we do allow trade in the goods. Think about that first line. The price of the capital intensive good is low relative to the price of the capital intensive good in the other country. So because it has a low price, it should be a quote competitive export. So the capital intensive, capital abundant country will be exporting the capital intensive good. The labor abundant country will be exporting the labor intensive good. And we're gonna find an equilibrium where this kind of arbitrage is no longer profitable, where the prices will be the same, but it will come, the adjustment mechanism is coming from the possibility of exports and imports. So let me show you an example picture. Suppose we have country B here with this production possibilities set in the two goods, G1 and G2. Now I'm not telling you exactly why it looks like this, but it has to do with the fact that uh, country two, country B, sorry, I said it wrong, is relatively abundant in one of the factors. Uh, you can see relative to country A, this country can produce a lot of good two and relatively little of good one. And that's because of the different factor intensity. The flip side of that is country A over here with its production possibility of frontier, and it can produce relatively more of good one than good two in the sense of enumerating all the possibilities. If you're in autarky, now you remember the Robinson Crusoe economy where we had Robinson Crusoe producing two goods, no trade. We had in autarky therefore, 
on the island, Robinson Crusoe's indifference curve would be tangent to his production possibility set. So this would be the autarky allocation in country B. Likewise, country A with a different technology, a different island, so to speak, would have another tangency of its indifference curve, preference indifference curves with a production possibility set. Now it's kind of a easier to draw with common preferences, having you know the same indifference curve tangent in both, but that's not a necessary part of the argument. What all we care about is tangency for country B relative to its indifference curves and tangency for country A in autarky relative to its indifference curves. Just happens to be the same indifference curve. Now, finally, we go from autarky to free trade. What must be the solution? Each country B over here will separate its consumption and production problems that will maximize profits by finding the point on its production possibility frontier, which gives it the highest level of profits. As captured by this profit line, budget line, really trade line, that emanates from the new change production point. Now note, the old production point was autarky for country B. It's now shifted to be giving up some of good one and producing more of good two, and then exporting good two and getting more of good one back. So it moves, its, it specializes more in production and then achieves balance in consumption by imports and exports. And country A down here is doing the opposite. It specialized more in production in the other direction, more of good one, and then trades in the world economy, giving up good one and getting good two. And although it's not drawn here, the exports of good one for country A are exactly equal to the imports of good one for country B. So the prices of the goods associated with this external price line are the same for both countries and have the property that finally we have an equilibrium in the goods market. In sum, we've now made the prices endogenous. P1 and P2, which were given throughout three-fourths of the lecture, are now determined internationally by free trade. All right, so we did hectorolene. Now we have another theorem, stolper samuelson theorem. In this two-by-two-by-two two two model with these varying factor intensities, if the price of good I increases, then the equilibrium price of the factor that's used more intensively in good I also increases, while the price of the other factor decreases. Let me say it again. If and, and let me give the motivation here. We're going from autarky in each country one at a time with its internal domestic prices to an equilibrium in the world economy with free trade at different prices. So for country B here, P1 over P2 is going down relative to what it will be in the free trade equilibrium and the reverse is true for country A. So when we go from autarky to trade, we're moving the price ratio in both countries. What in different directions, but we're moving it. So let's say, what is the impact now of moving a price? If we increase the price of good I relative to the other good, the equilibrium price of the factor that was used more intensively in the production of good I will increase, while the price of the other factor will decrease. Okay, so let's go back to a proof of this in the earlier diagram, you know, setting aside the two countries, kind of not asking for a minute where the price comes from, except that where previously we had these ISO cost lines crossing, the cost lines associated with P1 and P2, we now increase the price of good one. So C1 equal to P1 is here. C1 equal to P prime one lies further out. It kind of stands to reason that it should lie further out because we've increased the price and we want cost equal to price. So if price is higher, cost can be higher and cost can be higher by having higher levels of W1 and W2 as the input prices. So the ISO cost line for the price, when the price increases, in this case, good one's price increases, shifts outward. We haven't done anything to the price of the other good. The C2, where is it? The C2 line is staying constant. The C2 ISO cost line at price P2 is staying constant. However, we know we need a crossing 
that an equilibrium is described by where the lines cross. So we would move from this initial crossing to this second crossing. And you can see as a consequence of the increase in price in P1 that the price of factor one, good one is intensive in factor one. That's the definition that we were given at the beginning. The price of good one increases. Therefore, the input, which is used intensively in good one, namely factor one, should increase and the other one decreases. So this diagram illustrates the stolper samuelson theorem. But again, in the context of free trade, those price movements come about for a reason. Namely, we've gone from autarky to free trade. So you could see earlier which way the price was moving depending on the initial country and, and the autarky. Now, although we know, again, to repeat the steps of the algorithm, we now know what happens to the factor prices from this diagram, what happens to the levels of the inputs and what happens to output. Well, we have this again, box for production. We had the initial allocation ratio of the factors as quantities crossed, that is to say the line for good one and the line for good two crossed and they crossed here, but now, those factor prices have changed as a consequence of the price change. The quantity of the first factor will go down because its price has gone up from country one's point of view. That produces a somewhat steeper sloped line and the opposite is going on with country two. So the new equilibrium is where these now changed slope lines cross. And you can actually see in this case that firm one is producing more because its isoquant will be higher and is using a higher level of both inputs. And likewise, the production of good two will contract. So again, this factor price equalization theorem is just to restate it in the two by two and two country model, as long as we have this factor intensity assumption holding and the countries are not completely specialized, the equilibrium price of factors inputs only depends on the technologies and on the output prices determined as it may be in such a way that the prices of the outputs equals the input costs. But now look, if both countries face the same prices because they trade in goods and otherwise there would be arbitrage, then since the prices are the same in both countries, we can zero inside each country and look at the factor prices which are clearing the factor markets in each country. And since each country has the same technology, these equations across the two goods in each country hold. If the prices are the same on the right-hand side as a consequence of free trade, then the solution to the input prices has to be the same on the left-hand side. So in short, Remarkably, we have not allowed trade in factors, no migration, but we've managed to equalize factor prices without migration simply by, by having trade in goods. So that's the famous factor price equalization theorem. So vis-a-vis -vis, you know, the US and Mexico allowing via NAFTA free trade in goods, even with a wall, if I dare say, prohibiting Mexican migration the theorem says that the wages in Mexico should rise in Mexico and fall to the US to the point that the wages are the same. So the factors bear consequences. It's not necessarily a good thing that wages of labor are falling in the US, not good for those firms. We have to come back to the well for those households. We have to come back to the welfare theorems to think about the, the winners and losers from trade. The point here only is that you can see why there is sometimes resistance to trade because trade does have consequences for factor prices, hence for the welfare of the providers of those factors, depending on whether they're capitalists that own wealth, capital that's used in machinery and so on, versus uh, laborers that have only their labor endowment. Okay, so next time we're going to go with this kind of theorem back to the Thai villages, and then we're going to go in the subsequent lecture to the US and, and explore these ideas. Okay, that's all I have for today. Okay, thank you very much.